We're continuing with Jeremiah. Tonight, chapter 29. If you want to turn in your Bibles, we'll be reading excerpts from several chapters. Historically, at this time and place when he's writing, uh, the city of Jerusalem is under fire. Uh, the temple is being destroyed. Uh, people are being taken as hostages uh, to Babylon. And uh, a lot of them are already in Babylon. And so maybe in your Bible, as in mine, it says in chapter 29, a letter to the exiles. And this is where Jeremiah is writing to those who are in captivity uh, to give them encouragement. We'll start with verse number four to read what he says in this letter. We'll go down to verse number nine. Jeremiah 29, starting with verse four. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them declares the Lord. All along, Jeremiah has been telling them that Jerusalem will be destroyed. Get out of town. What then were these lying prophets telling them that they were listening to? Yeah, it was lies. What specific lies? Everything's fine. You don't have to leave. Right. Everything's going to be okay, peace and safety. Uh, Jeremiah's trying to warn them. However, uh, they are mad at him. They think he's a traitor. They think that he's, uh, you know, loving Babylon more than he's loving uh, them. But uh, God has plans for them in the future. And he wants them, because remember now, that's, as a matter of review, uh, how many years will they be in exile in Babylon? Seventy years. Seventy years. And after that, what's going to happen? Go home. That's right. They'll come back to Jerusalem. And then what we already read in Ezra and Nehemiah uh, will come to pass. What did we read in Ezra and Nehemiah? Rebuilt the city, rebuilt the temple, restored the worship, uh, rebuilt the walls. And so things are going to get better, but uh, God is going to give them some punishment. So you, we already answered the question, but look in verses 10 through 14 and notice how God is planning to prosper them after this 70 years in their homeland. Drop down to verse number 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. I love this verse. I, I use it uh, myself. Betty bought me a, uh, Be Betty bought me a cover uh, for my 
a checkbook, and uh, I've had it years and years. It's fallen apart, but I won't let go of it because it has this verse on it. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then verse 12 says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You see, right now God can't listen to them. Uh, their prayers mean nothing to him. Their sacrifices mean nothing to him. And why is that? Right, took up idol worship and lived ungodly, wicked lives. Uh, this idol worship that they got into, what are some of the things that were involved with the idol worship that made the Lord very angry? Huh? They killed their own children, yeah, and uh, sacrificed them to the god Baal, I mean, and it did it by burning them alive. Uh, what else was involved in this type of worship? Sexual immorality. That's right. They had male prostitutes, female prostitutes. Uh, they'd go to the temple, have sex with them, give them money uh, for their God, and then uh, uh, they called that worship. What they tried to do was this. And that's what really made God angry. They tried to carry on, which they did. They carry on the temple. It's still beautiful. Uh, the worship was beautiful. They had professional singers, a professional orchestra. Uh, they had wonderful worship, and they would go on the Sabbath and do that, and then they'd go up into the hills and worship their idols, and eventually it got to the point that they were even worshiping the sun in the temple. Sun worship, S-U-N, sun worship. And these were elders that were doing that. Uh, they cleaned out the storage rooms and made them available for the prostitutes. So God was really, really mad, and he's punishing them, and we understand why. But there is a few that's going to come back and rebuild and restore. And um, many of those left behind felt that they were the privileged ones. They thought God took the worst, but did he? Took the best. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Now, we're going to go to chapter 30. And in chapter 30, verses 1 through 3, Jeremiah again is reiterating this same idea. Uh, Israel's going to get to come back. And he's not going to completely destroy them. It's called a remnant. You see that word remnant a lot in the scriptures. A remnant is just a little bit, not a big number, but enough. And he'll use this remnant to uh, build the nation back. So let's read three verses of chapter 30 in which he uses this theme. Verse 1, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write in a book all the words I've spoken to you. Well, I guess Jeremiah did a good job because here's the book. Uh, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. So drop down to verse 10, and he's going to tell Jeremiah, that I'm not going to completely destroy Israel. I will punish Israel. They'll go through famine so bad that they'll eat their own children. Uh, they'll be killed by the sword, by the enemy. Some of them will be killed by the enemy. And, and what famine and what murder by the enemy doesn't take them, he'll send them some diseases to kill them. So he's going to give them terrible punishment. But still, he's going to be merciful to them. So we think about grace in the New Testament, but God was gracious even in the Old Testament. He's always been a gracious God. Now look at verses 10 and 11 of chapter 30. So 
So do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. That's, that's another name for Israel because uh, Jacob was one of the founders of Israel. Do not be dismayed, Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place, which is where? Babylon. Your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. Verse 11, I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. They deserve some punishment, but he isn't going to utterly destroy them from the face of the earth. Chapter 31 is very interesting because there's prophecies that we read about in the New Testament. And I want you to start with verse number 15. And see where you heard this before from the New Testament. Let's start reading with verse number 15 of chapter 31, and I'll give you an, a time to think about it, and somebody maybe can answer me. Uh, verse 15 through 17. This is what the Lord says. I heard a voice in Ramah, mourning, and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. Now, Rachel, this is symbolic of the Rachel who was Jacob's favorite wife in the Old Testament, who had his two favorite sons, and who were they? Joseph and Benjamin. And she, draw, she died, of course, having Benjamin. Rachel weeping for her children. So this is symbolic of the nation mourning is what it is, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And look at verse 16. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your descendants, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. This is sometimes referred to as a Double prophecy. Where did you hear those words before? That's one. All right. Hold on there. Hold that thought. Where in the New Testament? You're getting close historically. It happened when Jesus was born, right? Rachel weeping for her children. When Herod murdered the little babies, right. That prophecy is found in Matthew 2, verses 16 through 18. So we have uh, that part of the prophecy and uh, way into the future. So look at Matthew 2, 16 through 18. Matthew 2, 16 through 18. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, going back to what Jackie said, there was an immediate, fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy regarding to the people carried into captivity. You're both right. Both right. That's the immediate prophecy. This is the one that came 600 years down the road when Jesus was born. What happened was this that made Rachel weep for her children. The Jewish people were gathered at Ramah, put in chains to be carried into Babylon. At one place in the scriptures, 
and they were completely humiliated. They stripped them of their clothing and took them to Babylon. So that was the prophecy about what happened to the children of Israel who rebelled against God and now were being carried into captivity. And it would also be applied to what Herod did to the little children uh, at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, one other thing that I want to mention about this chapter is, look at verses 31 to 34, another prophecy carried over to the New Testament. Now, someone asked me just the other night about the uh, scriptures. Uh, I think it was Susan talking to me. She said, didn't it say that the Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica because uh, <coughs> they studied the word to see if what Paul said was true? And she said, you just said, though, that the word wasn't written yet, uh, the New Testament. And I said, that's right. I said, they were studying the Old Testament prophecies regarding Jesus to see if what Paul was saying true. That's how they knew that Jesus was the Messiah because they understood the prophecies and they kept going back to the prophecies that were fulfilled. There's over 300 prophecies that deal with Jesus in the New Testament. So we're going to see here in verses 31 to 34 the prophecy of a new covenant. What is the new covenant? Yeah, the gospel of Jesus Christ, our New Testament. That's, that's recorded here. And Jeremiah says that's going to happen in the future. We'll start with verse 31 and read through 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. What covenant was that? Who did they make? Who did, they, who did he make that covenant with? Moses, right. And uh, they, he went up in the mountain and got what? Ten commandments. So that was, and we're going to keep that in mind as I take you to the New Testament in just a second. When I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant. See, that's what they were doing now in the time of Jeremiah. They broke the covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. He loved them dearly like a husband. This is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will, now notice this very carefully. The difference between the old covenant written in stone and the new covenant that was established by Jesus. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Look, if you will, in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. For 2 Corinthians, keeping in mind some of the things that he said here about their hearts, about the covenant written in stone, laws written in stone. What is the... What is the biggest thing about the problem of the law? Couldn't keep it. Is that what you're going to say? Powerless. Powerless. Okay, right. The main, both of those are right. They couldn't keep it. You can't keep the law. Uh, the law is good. Jesus said it was good. Uh, Paul said the law was good. Uh, and uh, there's not, all the laws that God put down to Moses, the Ten, Ten Commandments and the others are very good. You know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, you know, honor your father and mother and, and all the others that we, we believe in and even practice in our culture today. I mean, we, we, theoretically we do, 
And, uh, but uh, we, you know, our laws are based on a lot of these things. You know, do not kill. If you do kill, uh, we'll kill you. Or do not steal. If you steal, we'll put you in jail, maybe, as long as you don't steal anything over $750. Uh, so, uh, you know, but the thing is, uh, the law was good, but humans cannot keep a law. You know, I, I think it's a good law uh, that, you know, I, I like West Virginia's law better that 119, you can go 65 miles an hour. Uh, you know, our law here is you have to go 55 miles an hour. I think that's a great law. How many people follow that law? I don't. If I get in a hurry, I'll see, I know they'll let me have five miles over and maybe even extra. I found out sometimes, though, that some of them don't. <laughs> so, laws are easily broken. The simple laws and the hard ones, the big ones, the important ones, the ones that have to do with lying and, and cheating and, and so on. And, but what's going to happen is in a new covenant, it's going to be a new heart, a new mind. Uh, why do Christians live separate lives from those that aren't Christians? It's because they've got a, the heart of Jesus and a new mind. And, and that's what makes the difference. Now we don't do the things that we know are right because there's a law that says we have to. We do it because we love God, we love others, and we love ourselves. We don't want to abuse ourselves. We don't want to abuse others. Uh, and so it's an all-new covenant, an all-new system. Uh, and let's look at it here. This is the last thing I'll say tonight. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Uh, that's the reason we've been able to maintain our Christian lives. Uh, not because it's any easier for us to obey laws than it is other people that aren't yet Christian. But, but we, are, we are not governed by laws anymore. We're governed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're governed by Christ's teachings. And this is what it says about it in 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves? In other words, are we beginning to brag on ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you, Paul was talking about the good life that he led before them. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. Now this third verse is very important. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone. You know, that's what Moses had. But on tablets of human hearts. So, I'm not planning to kill anybody. But not because the law said so. But because Jesus said so, because that's the right thing to do is not injure anybody. I'm not planning to steal from anybody. Not just because the law said so. But you see, I've got a, the spirit of the living God in my heart now. So that's the difference. It's interesting how many prophecies in the Old Testament are so related uh, to the New. We'll stop with that and pick up with chapter 32 uh, next time. Do you want to say anything tonight regarding the, these readings?